Your exams due Thursday, correct? No, not this class. Sorry. On my next class. Your exams are until I have God knows when. A couple of weeks or something like that because we have the middle English stuff still to do. I still don't understand what happened to this class. I mean, I entered a time warp or something. Okay, so picking up where we left off two weeks ago, um, we had just done this fun stuff, talking about the strong and weak declensions um, for both nouns and adjectives, okay, and talked about the endings and how you apply the endings, etc., to the nouns, okay. Um, so, verbs. Verbs have weak and strong conjugations, and because we've already talked about lights, do move a little bit more or not? Um, English is a Germanic language, so it does have um, weak and strong forms. And those weak forms, again, because it's Germanic language, makes that past tense with a dental suffix. Whether that dental suffix is a d or t, okay? Usually, the only time that it's a d sound and not a t sound is when you have some kind of accent on that final syllable. Usually, that's primarily for poetic reasons, for reasons of meter. For example, sometimes you'll see in Shakespeare, um, something like, or in the Renaissance, with a, a um, what is that, a grave? Accent on that final E, so it's pronounced walkin, okay, rather than walked. Almost every other time, even if it's a D, it's got that t pronunciation, okay? So, weak verbs are easy in that sense. And in fact, you know, listen to a baby learning to speak, in English at least, okay? And what will that child do with verbs as the child starts to learn verbs? They're all this. It forms all of them this way. The child will form almost all verbs this way by throwing a t sound on the end. Think t, drink t, etc. Okay? And it has to be corrected. Why? Because think and drink are not weak verbs. Those are strong verbs. Now, Old English, if I remember correctly, I might have a number up here somewhere. Old English originally had something like about 300 strong verbs. There are fewer than 60 that survive in modern English. Why? They're dying out. That's really not the best way of putting it. They're changing. They're changing to weak verbs. For example, um, and I've used this in class before, the verb to plead. Like to plead guilty. Almost universally, if you read that past tense in a newspaper, what will the journalist write? They won't say he pled. He pleaded guilty. Okay. The past tense actually is pled. Right? You'll sometimes even see so and so leaded <coughs> rather than correct spelling lead. Because if you spell it this way, you're referring to a metal. <laughs> All right? Um, what about, you know, dive? Dove. Within 50 years, it's going to be entirely dived. Drive, drove. That's probably going to stay drove for quite a while. Okay? Um, so, strong verbs, however, how do they show past tense? You have what's called ablaut. Can I have that up there? Yeah. 
2521. Past tense preterite formed by vowel change. Oblaut. This happens in all Germanic languages. Okay. This goes back to kind of Proto-Germanic, the earliest Germanic. Why? We don't know. That is why they make this kind of change. We don't know. There are some theories, and I'll talk about one of them um, in a moment. Okay? So, so what happens with oblaut? Well, with the present tense, the vowel that is in the infinitive is generally a front vowel. So if you have that vowel triangle, okay, front vowels are on this side. So here's the triangle. Front vowels are everything on this side. Back vowels are everything on this side. E, 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 e. You know, the ah is kind of in between. But once you get to the ah, ah, o, u, u, those are all back vowels. So e, 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 those are all front vowels, okay? Present tense, we've got these front vowels. And then what happens? As you move to the past tense, those front vowels they tend to become back vowels. Okay, front vowels up here are what? They're called high and tense. Why? The mouth, the muscles in the mouth are tense when you say E, E. As you get lower and closer to the back, the mouth loosens up. E, 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 excuse me, A. E, a, o, I mean, your, your jowls just kind of you know, start to jiggle when you get back here. One of the theories that's been proposed for that, for why present tense, generally tense front vowels, past tense, generally lax back vowels, has to do with their Germanic mindset. Those of you who've had um, my history, not history, this is the history of the English language, my Britlet 1, 3010 course. When we talk about Bede and we do the part about the conversion of England, we always talk a little bit about Germanic mythology. Because in that passage in Bede, talking about the conversion of England from paganism to Christianity, or let me rephrase that. The conversion of the Anglo-Saxons to Christians. There's a passage where Bede recounts what a priest of the pagan religion says. And he says, you know, O great and mighty king, if our religion had any purpose, had any use, had any force, I would be the most blessed man in the world. Why? Because I follow it perfectly. And yet, I get squat. He essentially says, you don't favor me, you don't shower me with gifts, etc. Therefore, our religion is meaningless and powerless. If this new religion has any force, any power, makes any better sense, we should follow it. Right? And then another priest, not the high priest, that guy was the high priest. Another priest said, you know, life kind of seems to me like this. It's like a sparrow flying. And during this time, that is while we are alive, it's like the sparrow flies from snow and hail and frost and enters into the window of a hall. And while it's inside the hall, it experiences what? It experiences light. It experiences warmth. It experiences revelry. It experiences song. It experiences pleasure. And then it flies out the other window of the hall and goes where? Back out into the darkness, into hail, winter storms, etc., etc. The life of man is like the period when the sparrow is in the hall. In other words, we don't know where we've come from, and we don't know where we're going. According to what, though? According to his pagan belief system. If this guy has a better story, he essentially says, if this guy can tell us where we come from, and more importantly, where we're going to, I think we should follow the better story. Well, the better story says what? 
made for a purpose, and that purpose on the other side of the hall is what? Eternal life with God. How does that compare with Germanic mythology? How does Germanic mythology ultimately end? Anybody know? That's the beginning of the end. Ragnarok. Not the stupid Marvel movie, because that's totally wrong. Ragnarok is what? That's the final battle between all the forces of good and all the forces of evil. All the forces of good, the pagan gods, Thor, Odin, Frigg, Freya, all their families. Who else? Us. Right? If we're alive, us. If we're dead and we're warriors, we come back from Valhalla, the hall of the slain. That's what Valhalla means. Okay? And that's pretty much it. So the gods and humans. And who do they fight? Well, the forces of evil, the frost giants, Loki, the Midgard serpent, Fenris Ulf, the great wolf, etc. Okay. Orcs, dwarves, elves, other giants. In other words, all the forces of chaos. See, the gods and humans were the forces of order. Everything else, forces of chaos. And in the Germanic system, in pagan Germanic mythology, this side wins. Chaos reigns supreme. Okay? So, ultimately, what kind of future is there? Yeah, none. They win. Everything else is destroyed. That's, that's, there is no future, right? In Germanic languages, there is no future tense. How do we create a future? Say you want to go to the store tomorrow. What do you say? I will go or I shall go. We have to introduce what's called a modal auxiliary. Will or shall. We don't add an ending onto the verb go. In Latin, you do. In Greek, you do. In Sanskrit, you do. In the other Romance languages, you do. In all the Germanic languages, you have to introduce a second verb to introduce that idea of futurity. Some people have theorized because Germanic, the Germanic mind doesn't allow for anything positive in the future, therefore, it did not create a future tense. Whether that's true or not, nobody knows. All we do know is Germanic doesn't have a future tense. Okay? By the way, if you remember what we said in, in the Indo-European part, neither does Hittite. And Hittite is the oldest known, oldest attested form of Indo-European language. So even though we've been saying, you know, Germanic and the Balto-Slavic languages have a relation because of the date of plural m, mm, okay? Germanic and Hittite also have another connection. And a long time ago, it was thought that Germanic possibly broke off earliest from the other Indo-European languages because of those seven characteristics that it doesn't share. Even though one of those seven characteristics we now know it does share with Hittite, okay? the two-tense verb system. Only the past, only the present. So, all that's just to talk about why, possibly, there is oblaut. Present tense, it's tense. That is, your life is tense. Right here, right now, right? How many of you are just totally at peace, man? I mean, you're, you're in nirvana. Yeah, I wish. Okay. When you think about yesterday, however, what does, you know, the stupid warthog in Lion King say? Yeah, Hakuna Matata, you got to what? Put your past behind you. Right? Because the past can't hurt you, can it? I mean, yeah, you can say the past has ramifications that go on to today, but 9-11-2001 cannot hurt you today. September 7th, uh, December 7th, 1942, 
1941, can't hurt you today. What happened yesterday can't touch you today. So, you go into the past, mentally, <sighs> yesterday's over. Yesterday might have been a horrid day. It's gone. Every day is what? Little Orphan Annie. It's a new day. It's sing the song. It's a wonderful day, you know. Tomorrow, however, mm, if you're Germanic, it's kind of like there's, there's what? There is no tomorrow. No tomorrow is guaranteed. Okay? I won't go off into my morbid rant like I usually do in a couple of my other classes. I, I, I think I scared the hell out of some of my students yesterday talking about, you know, not knowing what is outside that door. We were talking about, you know, being afraid of the unknown. It's Harry Potter. Being afraid of the unknown. Er, not Aristotle. Socrates tells his followers, and this kind of applies, so I'll, I'll chase this rabbit <laughs> until it dies, <laughs> probably. Socrates tells his followers when Plato and others come to him after his trial, after he's been found guilty, and just before he's getting ready to drink the hemlock. They say, we bought off the guards, you can escape, you can leave Athens, and you can live out your life to your natural ending days. Socrates says two things. One, to leave Athens would be suicide. That is, if I left Athens, I would no longer be an Athenian. Well, 5th century BC, Athens, your identity was tied entirely to where you were from. If you're Athenian, it was tied to being an Athenian. If you're a Spartan, it was tied to being a Spartan. If you're Mycenaean, it was tied to being from Mycenae, etc. If you left there, you became a nobody. Literally, you became a nobody. Persona non grata. Okay? So he said, I can't leave Athens. I might as well die. Well, <laughs> that's what he's about to do. He says, besides... Why should I be afraid to die? That is, why should I be afraid to take the hemlock? They're like, what do you mean? It's death. Aren't you afraid to die? He goes, no. Why should I be? We fear what is known. Somebody pulls a gun on you. That's time to wet your pants. That's time to be afraid. That's time to think, I'm going to die. Somebody walking down the street, however, you don't necessarily fear that person. Until they maybe do something. Similarly, because you walked out this door, maybe you've been you know, blessed or cursed, however you put it, you know, to be solely in Peck Hall most of your career. And for those of you who are English majors, you know, unfortunately you are cursed that way. Because you walked out this door a number of times already, what are you expecting to happen at 925? You'll walk out this door just like every other time you walked out this door. But what if today's not like every other day? What if today's like 10 years ago, Virginia Tech, when a crazy student woke up one morning and thought, I'm going to kill a bunch of people. And he goes to school and he kills 32 students, including himself. Well, unfortunately, that kind of scenario literally happens about once every couple of years on an American campus. Might not be 32, might be one or two, might be three or four. Okay? But we don't know that that's going to happen. So if you fear the unknown, I guess you all are going to be in this room for the rest of your lives because you don't know what's outside that door. You don't know what's going to happen when you get in your car in the morning. And yet you do every morning. Okay? That's. It does what? It kind of, you know, shakes your foundations a little bit. That's why Socrates said, because we don't fear the unknown, we shouldn't fear death. Death is just the unknown. That's why he says what Rowling essentially put in Dumbledore's mouth at the end of the first Harry Potter story. Socrates essentially says, death is but the next great adventure. What do you have to do? Prepare your mind. 
and it's Hamlet. Hamlet says, Act 5, he's talking to his friend, um, Horatio. He's talking about death, and he says, the readiness is all. What does Hrothgar say to Beowulf? Be prepared. You don't know when death is coming. Okay. Tolkien says that's the theme, essentially, of all Old English literature. The death of man and all his works. So, prepare. Okay. Back to this. Present, uh, excuse me, infinitive, okay, past tense, first person singular, past plural, past participle. Notice that you have what are called seven types or seven classes of strong verbs. Why? Because they each one begin with a somewhat different vowel in the infinitive, but then in the preterite first person singular, they move from that vowel to a different vowel. Okay? And then that vowel changes, usually, to the preterite plural. But notice what also happens. When you get to the plural and the participle, you get an ending added on. Okay? So whenever you're reading Old English, and you see a word that ends, for example, in O-N, you can be almost positive if it's at least a two or three syllable word, you can be almost positive that word is a preter plural verb. So that's telling you something. It's telling you one, the subject is what? Plural. We or they or something. Okay. And it's past tense. So it's not happening now, it happened before. Okay. So if you were taking a graduate course in Old English, <coughs> what you would be told to do at this point is pull out some index cards and write, you know, class one, the infinitive form, that's the, the kind of um, standard word to use for it, be done, okay? And write be done and its meaning to await. And then write the past first person singular, bod. So, ich bod, ich I, bod, I, it's past tense, so to await becomes what? I waited, or awaited, if you want. And then you write the printer plural, be done. So it's now not I awaited, it's we awaited, and then past participle. We await it again. Okay. Be dead. Okay. Class two. Another index card. Because as you come across verbs, you then kind of want to add them to that first index card for the class one verb. How do you know it's a class one verb? Well, if you have a book like this, when you look up a word in the glossary at the back, it tells you. You don't just automatically look at it and go, light bulb, I know what it is. No, you have to use a glossary that tells you what it is. And once you study these for more than a year, you will start to see the similarities and start to be able to put them in their various classes. So when I, for example, took Old English, and what I taught my Old English students to do was to just kind of start to chant these. Be done by, be done, be then. Be done, on, not. What do we tend to do? Final syllable, two syllable words in modern English. Uh. Be done. Uh. It's the default sound of the English speaking mouth. Like, put the D in front of it. Duh. Okay? So, be done, bod, be done, oh. Not the uh, be then. Be done by be done be then. Next one, be done bad, <coughs> boo done bo den. Next one, brucon. It's the same class, but it's a slightly different vowel. Brucon, break, brucon, broken. There's the modern English. Broken. 
just slightly, because we don't say N, we just say it broke, un, right? Bindan, bond, bundan, bunden, baron, bear, baron, foren, tread on tread, tread on treadin, far on for, for on fire. And if you know German, that's exactly the same as modern German. It's just spelled with an H in front of the R and an E instead of the A. Far on for, for on faren, hot on hit, hit on hot ten, feodan, feod, feodan, felden. Failed, uh, getting pretty close to just modern English fold. Okay, so those are the seven types of strong verbs, and this is how the vowel, and I'm in your notes, the vowel in there is in bold, showing how the vowel changes. Okay, and then you know, there's other examples. Um, in terms of what's called the reduplicating verb, etc. Okay, before I go on, any questions about this? You don't have to memorize this. If this were a course in Old English, yes, you would. Why? Because just memorizing it would help you in reading text and translating those texts by just getting that stuck in your mind. Right? One of the best ways of learning a foreign language is just sheer, sheer rote memorization of paradigms and such. I've got a stack of index cards. I don't know. There's 500 or 1,000 from when I was um, taking Latin as a doctoral student. Uh, where do we finish there? Pronouns. Pronouns. I say complex, though not much more so than today. Okay. Look for a moment. Where is it on here? This is this is the um, Old English cheat sheet that I linked to in the syllabus. Okay, this is from Peter Baker's website at the University of Virginia that he uses with his class, and it works with his. Um, Look, I'm going to zoom, actually. Move that over a bit. Zoom up a little bit. Okay. More complex than today, though not much more. It's kind of a lie. So, I, itch, okay. Accusative, so direct ob object. Me, mech, what's the direct object in modern English? Me, okay? We don't have a ch on any ending. Um, dative, may, like modern English, dative and accusative are both the same, may, okay? Um, genitive, mean, mine, do we use mine today much? We can say that is mine, or we say that, do we say that is mine dog? No, that is my dog. Do we say that is mine apple? No, but if we were live in Shakespeare's day, we would. What's the difference between my dog, mine apple? Apple begins with a vowel. In the Renaissance, in Middle English period, when the following word began with a vowel, you used the pronoun form that ended with an e sound. Thine ein, mine ein. Okay. My house, thy house, etc. Look at you know look. We'll do some of this when we get to the, more of the Middle English and the um, early Renaissance period. Because Shakespeare will go back and forth. But the fact that you had different sentence structure also, didn't they? Instead of saying, my dog, they would say, the dog is mine. Sometimes. Sometimes. Not not all the time. Right? Um, 
Uh, let's go on down. So, Oh, no, I'm going to do it. Got it. Sorry, I'm going to move this over to the so that we can see all of the things. So, going across from here, nominative, accusative, genitive, dative. This is now plural. The, fetch, you, or ye. Ye is plural. Nominative. As well as um, accusing, right? So, oh, I think that's second person. First person, se sorry, second person, not both. Um, so, you, again, this just completely drops off. Thine, okay? So, my, mine, thy, thine. Data, they, like accusative. Skip the middle one for a moment and just look at the plural. So, I, we, name H, he gave it to me, okay? He gave it to us, is the pronunciation, us, same as today. Ure, ure, our, okay? Us, us, nominative, plural, ye. But not with a Y or a thorn, with a G E. Right? We'll talk about that when we get to the Middle East Greek. Accusative, EAL, EAL becomes you. I gave it to you. Right? This becomes ye in the Middle English Greek. So you and ye are different in the Middle English period. You, sorry, is accusative. Ye is plural nominative. O ye of little faith, Christ says, right? King James. Because this you and ye distinction, that's maintained in the King James Version of the Bible. Even though in Shakespeare's day, Every day, ordinary English people would use walking down the street, going to the pub and stuff. They wouldn't make a distinction between you and ye. It was pretty much all you at that point. Right? Um, what's this? Our, your. Okay? And then eow, you again. Now, in between the singular and the plural, you have what's called Dual. What's dual? Dual all every time. Everywhere, all places, all times. Means what? Two. It never means three. And it never means one. It's only two. So nominative sing, uh, nominative dual, not singular, wheat. That's used only in instances where you're saying we two. You and I, right? Unk, right? Unker, unk, mit, ink, inker, ink. What happens to the duel? Gone. It's just totally gone. Why? Because it gets replaced with something like we or we too. What's the difference between you, singular, and you, plural? How can you tell in a sentence? Especially in speech. Context? Conjugation, possibly. Not in modern English, you can't really. You are, you are. You singular are. You W R or you class are. Southern English can be you, y'all. Though I have had native southern speakers Say, y'all can be used singularly also, no. which doesn't just sound right. right? I know, it's you all. Or if you're from the Northeast, use guys, you know. Um, okay, third person. So, first, second person, 
dual, plural, third person. Third person, both singular and plural. Hmm. Now we have to bring in gender, right? Because here we don't have gender. And I'm talking about me. The itch doesn't have any kind of masculine ending, right? But when we go to the third person, we do distinguish, right? Modern English. He, her, he, she, right? He, she, it. So masculine nominative, he, he, right? Masculine accusative, he, ne. Accusative, direct object, right? What is that modern English? Him, okay? Um, genitive is dative, him. Notice the dative takes the form or replaces the form for accusative. Why? Because dative and accusative tend to just meld together in um, modern English. Neuter, it. And if you've read much Southern fiction, you will see hit used a lot. Faulkner uses it a lot. Okay. Flannery O'Connor uses it quite a bit. Even though there it's for it. Not, you know, the specifically needed for. Feminine, hell. So what word is this in modern English? She. Okay. Hia. Gone. Hira. Her. So what happens to hell? It gets replaced with she. We have no idea where the word she etymologically comes from. It's not from Old Norse. It's not from Latin. It just kind of shows up. It doesn't show up just as she. It shows up as S-C-H-O, S-C-H-E, S-H-O sometimes show, and then S-H-E, right? Um, third person plural, hea, hera, him. What are our third person plurals? They, their, them. Where do they, their, and them come from? Old Norse. Every time we say they, their, or them, we're speaking Viking. And when we say they are, we're even speaking more Viking. Right? Because that are construction is also Viking. So when my grandmother with an eighth grade education would say, we was, the was there, okay, that's native old English. We were, that's getting closer to um, the Viking, or they was, okay? She had the they from Viking was from Old English. Um, so even though I said, you know, the pronouns are a little bit simplified, eh, not much. Now this is where it gets really fun. What was that? Demonstrative pronouns. What are the demonstrative pronouns in modern English? This or that. This dog, that cat. They're demonstrative because they point straight to, which is why I always tell students, don't begin a sentence with just this. This is because, because I'll always put after the this, this what. Usually you, you're meaning this everything that came before. But usually the everything that came before is more than one thing. It's a whole bunch of things. Right? So this points to something. This, that, or these, those. So we have four forms in modern English. Look how crazy this is. Right? Nominative singular. Se, se kunin, this king, okay? Accusative, thona, thona kuninger, might have an e on the end. Genitive, thes 
kinniness, this king, or of this king, or belonging to this king. Dative, fam. Instrumental, the, phone. All these in modern English are what? This. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six different forms for modern English, this. Only in the masculine. What about feminine? How do we distinguish between feminine and masculine in modern English? We don't. Okay? Why? Because all that grammatical gender dies. And it gets replaced, we'll talk about it in a little bit, a little bit with analytical gender. Right? So, feminine, sel, fa, 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 fa. Feminine's a little bit easier. You've only got three forms as opposed to six. One, two, three. Okay? Neuter, fat, 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 fan, fi, con. Okay? So you have four forms, excuse me, five forms. A little bit easier than the masculine, more difficult than the feminine. Plural. All genders, they all just kind of become the same. Tha, tha, thara, fam, fam. So, these have got to do what? They've got to match the nouns that they modify according to case, number, and gender. So, if you're using plural queen and it's feminine, What's it got to be? Well, it's plural, so you're not even thinking about this, but it's plural, and it's queen, and it's nominative. Fa. Fa queen, I think it's uh, ah. No, os. Fa queenas, or queen, right? If it's genitive, thara. So almost every time when you see the word thara, with that F-A-R-A, -A, you know that's genitive plural. Why? Because none of these others end with a A. Right? Again, this would be a note card. <laughs> you got to just memorize this sucker and, and beat it into your brain so that you're not, if you're translating, so that you're not looking back to a book every time. Right? Takes a while to um, get it to set in. Okay, so let's have a little fun. Parable, parable, parable of the prodigal son. Parable of the prodigal son from Luke 15. All right, you know the basic story. Guy goes to his father, says, "Give me my inheritance. I want to leave." Takes the inheritance, goes off, blows it all, ends up living with pigs and swine. Wakes up one morning and goes, "I'm a damn fool." Comes to his senses, runs back home. Father runs out to meet him, welcomes him home. So, so he, pretty easy, quaff. Yes, go ahead and use what people call Old English, Elizabethan English. This becomes what? Blank the raven nevermore. Quoth. Quaff, quoth. So the Truly, so, how many of you read Shakespeare's Julius Caesar? Who comes and warns Caesar? Beware the eyes of March. The soothsayer. He's not soothing Julius Caesar. He's warning him. He's a truth sayer. So, so, liche. Liche becomes modern English, leave. L-Y, ending. Okay? Adverbial. So, Truly, sum man have the twayen sunna. Why isn't this twayen? It's palatalized because it's between those two kind of high front vowels, a. Okay, so sum. That's not some. It looks like some, and because it looks like some. If we were studying French, I would say, beware of faux amis, false friends. Things that look like something that you think it should be, but it actually isn't. This 
In Old English, it means one. Okay? So, truly, one man, take the v out. And what's the pronunciation? That had, had the twain sunna, two sons. Okay? Notice, twain is indicating what number was. More than one, right? So it's plural. Sunna, right? Tha quaff, tha here means then. Quaff, again, say there's that masculine, nominative, demonstrative pronoun. Then said the, or a definite article also, the yingra. That's, uh, no, not child. Younger. The younger to his father, father, sell, <coughs> give. But what's it sound like? Take the final air off. It sounds like sell. Well, the modern English verb sell comes from the old English to salen, which means to give. So in the Lord's Prayer, we're told, sell us to die. Sell to us today. It doesn't mean modern English sell, though. It means give. Okay? So, sell a, me, give me, mine. Oh, no, not really. This is the digraph, right? It's the ash. But what would happen if you turn that E and that A around? Deal. What do you do when you deal out cards? Okay, but well, what are you giving to each person? A portion. Give, deal, means portion. So give a portion. Okay? So give me my portion, Minra, of my Akka, what is owed, okay? by you to me, okay? to your bear, um, to carry. To bear away. Okay? Then, thou, duh, notice now it's what tense. Okay? Here, thou is a noun. Give me my portion. Then, this is the verb. What tense? <coughs> Past tense. Thou, duh. It's got that dental suffix. Okay? Then, thou, duh. Hey, him, his, akka. Then, dalda, then, dealt, he, to him, his, possessions. Or what he owed, or owed. That is, his portion of his inheritance. Okay? Notice the syntax of that last sentence. <coughs> we begin with the adverb, right? Then, and then what? What comes very next? The verb. Modern English, do we do that? Not usually. Modern English is subject, verb, object. Modern English would be fa, hey, why hey? Because it's nominative case, it's the subject. Fa, hey, thou to him, then he dealt to him his akta. That's how it would be in modern English. See, but in old English, because the cases tell us what the grammatical import is, okay, the syntax can vary a bit so that you can have verb before subject and object. Right? Then, after, what's that look like? A few. Dog. What is U-M? Always. Data plural. UM is always data plural. After a few dive days, okay, all his things, the Ganaroda, he gathered up. The younger of the sons, that's genitive plural, and Ferda, 
It's that verb, that class seven or so, strong that we looked at, traveled, fared, reclice, that is, he went off, kind of like exile, because the word for rack, this one, is the word from which we get modern English wretch. To be a wretch means you are in exile. You are no longer at home. On Fairland Reche in a faraway kingdom, and for Spilda, usually when you get the, the prefix for, it kind of means entirely. Right? Spilda. Spilled. He entirely spilled or wasted it away. Okay? There his acta, his possessions. Lidvinda, living, on his Galsen. And I'm trying to complete my poem on Galsen. Then he, um, they had all, and the they there is talking about his, where is it? His octa, his belongings. When he had given it all away, wasted it all up, then became great hungry in that kingdom. That is, what happened in the kingdom? There was a famine. And he became um, wagla, essentially hungry and destitute. Uh, Fahrenheit and Folgada followed another Bursitan in those who sat around the kingdom. Uh, men of that kingdom, and then sent he to them to his town that he held his swine. So, because he became poor and gave everything up, what did he do? He went and worked for a man to watch his swine. You will know there. Desired. William. Wanted. Hey, his wamba, wamba, his womb, to fill of some ben kodum. We don't think of bean cods. What's meant by cod? It's the covering. It's the husk over beans. Like a um, pea. What's the word? Pod, thank you. Like a pod of peas, okay? He filled his belly with what? Not the beans, the husks, okay? That the swine ate, and him mon non selda. And to him, man gave nothing. So he's become like what? The swine. There. Then. Be thochte. Leave the bay out. Thochte. It's almost the modern English. Take out the e. Eh. Thought. Thought. Then thought he to himself. It's reflexive. So the thought came to him, and he said, kind of to himself, Eala, lo. Light bulb goes off in his mind. Who, how, who becomes ow, how, Bela drops off, modern English. Many, hirlinga, hirelings, plural, in my father's house, enough, la. Take the H off, la. Change the vowel. Just start changing vowels. See if there's a word that can become modern English. Lif, laf, loaf. How many? Enough? Loaf. Loaf of what? Bread. That's what that means. How much bread? What? The hirelings in my father's house. Notice the verbs being tacked on at the end of the clause here. Right? 
And if I here in hunger for wear the waste kind of away. Itch arise up. I, the ending here is telling us he's talking about futurity. So I will arise and I will travel to my father and I will say to him, Lo, father, I singoda. I sinned. On, on there means against heaven and before you. Now I ne am. Ne is a enclitic. That is, it gets applied to something else, usually a verb. Now I not am. We're the worthy that I. Am your Sunu son named. I'm not worthy to be named your son. Do me swa ana of Kenan here the new one. Do to me as to one of your hirelings. Hire me as a servant. And he arose then. So that's what he thinks. He hasn't arisen yet. He's thinking, okay, here's what I'm gonna do. He plans it all out. And he arose then, did to his father, and tha, what's the next word? G-I-E-T. We even have the pronunciation almost in modern English. Yet. Yet. Okay. And then, when yet he was far from his father, he, hina, yesea. Who's the he down here before the hina? It's the father. Does what? Yesea saw Hina, him, who's the him? The returning son. Notice the father sees this while the son is still a long way off. And whereth mid mild heartness and became with a mild heart a steered, that is, he got up, and onion, onion. Um, received him mercy, with mercy and grace, and him, Hina Beklipta, okay, clasped him and kissed him. Okay? We won't do any more of this. You can get the idea. So, that's an example of Old English. So now let's go on a little bit. Now maybe we shrink. So vocabulary. So that's the that's the kind of basic introduction to the sounds, the structure of the language. This section is pretty much all on oh, it doesn't look focused on me. That's fine. Um it's just on the vocabulary, okay? So, Old English had a unique ability for self-creating compounds and such. You have, as an example, the kenning. Now, kennings were poetic constructions, right? That is, they probably weren't used in everyday speech. So, for example, you might have swan rod, or huana, or huan rod, swan road, whales road. Well, what's the road that the swan travels on? Or what's the road that the whale travels on? The ocean. So you use that instead of ocean. Why? One, it's more poetic. Two, you might need a word that begins with s for alliterative reasons. Or you might need a word that begins with for alliterative reasons. Okay? Similarly, you have words like 
die red. Day red. I'm seeing, you know, I don't know. Sunset or sunrise. That's when the day is red, right? You look in the eastern horizon and it's red in the morning, okay? Um, Hilda Leocht. Hilda means battle, left, light, battle light. Well, we might think today gunfire, but they didn't have guns. So how do you get light from battle? It's not torches. Well, what happens sometimes if you strike metal against metal? It sparks. Okay. So they had a whole bunch of these. Old English cannons are relatively easy compared to Old Norse cannons. And I always mean to do this, and I always forget. There's an Old Norse cannon in one of the Old Norse um, sagas. I was taking Old Norse at the same time as I was doing Beowulf. Um, I never recommend doing that, by the way. Um, and I came upon this one passage. And it's a, it's a passage of poetry that's about five or six lines long. Five or six lines long. That's all a single kidding for memory. It's something like, in the back room of the cabin in the ship of my mind, it's, it's how it literally gets translated. And it all stands for memory. Okay? So that's one thing. Old English prefixes and suffixes. Like we've seen with the four and the bay, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. okay, allow for all kinds of writing because they each add nuance, as do you know Latin and Greek prefixes, right? So what happens with most of those old English prefixes? Most of them get replaced in the middle and early modern English periods by Latin prefixes. There's only a few instances where we keep some of those old English ones. For example, you would say, using the old English prefix, I am unwell today, if you didn't want to say I'm sick. What replaces un? Louder? Not. Not, okay. It's not a prefix. That kind of becomes, or that is kind of derived from that old English net and clinic, the negative, right? What else? You wouldn't say, I am undisposed. You would say, I am indisposed. This is Latin. This is old English. The Latin tends to replace the Old English form. Okay. Um, I don't think I have any examples. So, uh, what else? Foreign loan words. Celtic. I think somebody in here said they're thinking of doing a paper on Celtic influence. The only problem is there's very few Celtic words adopted into the English language, about 20. And almost all of those are place names. I've got a, um, for example, Craig from Welsh Craig, Gaelic Craig, Cross. Cross, like you know that, from Welsh crog or crug, Gaelic croak, Welsh crogy Gaelic crook, which means to hang, coom or comb, like Cumberland River, the Cumberland Gap, Cumberland University, etc. From Welsh coom, Warnish, Cornish coom, or Irish coomar. So those are all kind of topographical, except for the cross. Place names. Avon, Cumberland, S, London, okay. Severn, Pims, Usk, but, but not daily kinds of words. Not the kind of words that 
the Romano Celts would use to describe their everyday life, like eating, drinking, sleeping, body parts, etc. Right? None of those words survive in modern English. All right? It's Latin. Latin, there's three phases of borrowing. We've talked about these a little bit. Right. So you have the Continental Period. When is that? That's before the Roman invasions of Britain. So it's the Continental Period because that's when Roman legions are fighting Germanic tribes. So what kind of words would enter Germanic? Because that's what we're talking about at that point. Would enter Germanic at that point. Well, words of trade. Some everyday words. Like, for example, at that border between where the Roman Empire was and the Germanic tribes north of that, you know, once they reached a quote-unquote peace of some sort, okay, what kind of words would they tend to borrow? Well, Modern English, for example, wine, comes from what? Latin, vinum. That's a word that comes in through the Continental Period. Why? Because the Germans are getting wine from Rome. Right? Modern English, dish, or Old English, dish, comes from Latin, discus. Right? It's another word that comes from the Continental Period. Modern English, street. Old English, strat. Comes from Latin in the Continental Period. Why? Who built streets? The Romans did. Right? Latin words through Celtic. I don't remember if I've... Yeah, got a couple of those. So, there, at the very top, continental period, battle, uh, camp, meaning battle from Latin, campus. We still use campus today, however, okay? Street from Latin, strata, wine from vinum, from Greek oinos, dish, etc. Coop from late Latin, cupa, okay? Celtic Chester from Celtic Chester from Latin Castra, also meaning camp. Okay. Um, the third period of borrowing from Latin. Okay. Latin Christianity. When does this begin? When does the Roman Christianization of the Anglo-Saxons begin? 597. When Pope Gregory sends Augustine. Okay. And with this, with Latin Christianity, notice, they're not just quote-unquote Christian terms. Yeah, you have ecclesiastical terms, like angel, altar, organ, psalm. Okay? Germanic tribes had no need for any of those words. Why? They didn't believe in angels. The only altars they had weren't really altars, per se. They didn't know what an organ was, and they didn't sing psalms. School terms. This is, we can blame Latin for all these. Grammar. Actually, that comes from ancient Greek, ultimately. Okay. Master from Magister. So if any of you go on and you get a Master of Arts, it means you are a Magister Artes. You have mastered that subject. Meter. School. <laughs> school. From ultimately Greek, skole, meaning leisure. Yeah, most people don't think so. Verse, and then daily terms. These are words people would use throughout their common lifetime or, or daily work and such. Circle, fever, if you have one. Giant, I don't know how that's quite a daily term. But. Legion, because they're all around you, the Romans that is. Place, place not meaning, you know, this place, but place like, you know, Park Place, if you're playing Monopoly. 
meaning street and such. Sponge, all right? Old Norse. So, lots of borrowings into English, all right? Why? Old Norse and, and Old English are very similar. They're not mutually intelligible, but they're close. That is, a Norse speaker and an Anglo-Saxon speaker would be able to communicate with, you know, some time and kind of some, some pretty good give and take, right? Where Old Norse has... Um, Oh, I see what I'm doing. I was thinking about this and this and this. And this. Where Old Norse has Old English has ch. So where Old English has ch, in Old Norse that would be a k sound. Similarly, where Old English has a sh, in Old Norse that would be a sk sound. So, it's because of those binaries, if you want, that we have these binary kind of terms. Ditch and dike. What's a dike? It's a ditch. It's just Old Norse. A ditch is a ditch, but it's Old English. What else? Shirt. This gets kind of weird. Skirt. Church, go to Edinburgh, Scotland, and you will not go to church, you'll go to Kirk. Okay? So the name Kirkpatrick, what is that? It's the Church of Patrick, the church named after St. Patrick and such. Okay? So you got an example there. March and Mark doesn't mean March like this, it means kind of borderland area. So you'll have, you know, something referred to as a mark, and it means it's a particular area of land, like a march is a particular area of land. The word march, by the way, Old English, mercia. Those was, that was the march is, kind of the borderland between Wessex, Alfred's kingdom, and the Ding law, right? Most Old Norse borrowings were everyday kind of words except for um, things like place names okay so let's look at some of these words cow meaning to dot but we don't spell it usually this way how do we spell it if so and so is really subservient to somebody else they what they cow cow but you don't need the cow part okay Comes from Old Norse. Egg. Egg. Comes from Old Norse alga. Okay. Old English for that is a. Totally dies out. Get, Old Norse geta. Give from geva. Keel from kjolder. Leg from lager. Loan from lan. Scrape from scrapa. Scrub from scrub. Skill from skillia. Skin from skin. Sky. Window. Notice, these are things you use every day. Now, window doesn't mean glass. It means hole in the wall. Vindalga okay, is the wind of the eye. Because what is an eye? It's an opening. It's the opening of the eye. Nostril comes from Norse. It's the nose hole. Literally, right? I think I've got more. Place names. Anglo Norse place names. So, words that end in B. 
are from Old Norse. Grimsby, Whitby, Derby, I can't remember if there's any nearby here. Bylaws. If you incorporate, start an incorporation, etc., you have to, you are required by the government to have bylaws. Bylaws mean kind of settlement laws. The laws that are going to govern that settlement. Okay? Thorpe means village. Thwaite, isolated piece of ground. Toft, piece of ground. What about Borough? Yeah, it's Old Norse. It's related to Burr. Old English, that's Burr. So Murfreesboro is the fortified place of Murfree. Because that's what Borough means. Fortified place. Longer spelling, obviously is like that, all right? If you go to the what used to be the Dane law today, East Anglia and Northumbria in England, these kind of place names dominate. Why? Because of the Viking settlement. Um, back to here. Okay. So that's borrowings, place names, grammatical influence. So that's been, we've been talking about the lexical stuff. <coughs> okay, grammatical influence. Latin and Celtic don't change the grammar. When we get to the Middle English period, French doesn't change the grammar. Old Norse is the only foreign language that actually changes the grammar of English. Probably because the two are so closely related. So, how? The final S ending on third person singular form of the verb. Loves, walks, talks, goes, runs, sings. All right? That is, he goes, she goes, he sings, she talks, etc. The final ing on present participles. Renning, singing, talking, living, loving, buying, whatever. All right? Old English, ende. All right? Or ande, as we'll see when we get to the Middle English. All right? Talked about these, the TH forms of the personal pronouns. Notice, that's not just vocabulary. It's grammar. It's changing the grammar there. Okay. Old English forms, he, here, him. So we talked about the borrowings. We looked at a bunch of Latin words and French uh, Celtic words, etc. So the Lord's Prayer in Old English, actually. Hold on just one second. Yeah, let me use this one. They're the same. But this one I also have from the Old English Orthography on the book. <clears throat> Fader Ure. So, Fader Ure. All final letters are pronounced. There are no silent letters at all in Old English. Everything is pronounced. Fader Ure. Who they art on Elvanum. Not heavenum, heavenum. Sithi nama yahalgo. Not yahalgo. God. Yahalgo. Yahalgo. Tobe come vin riche. Ye worthe vin rila on erdan. Swa, swa on helvonum. Okay? Even with that diphthong, hell, hell. A diphthong is two vowels jammed together. You pronounce them as one syllable. Hell. Hell. You start with the first one, you move to the second one. We still do it. Think of that word. Voit. Voit. Before you get to that s, voit, you start to make the i. Voice. You just don't go voice. 
Okay. So back here on air van swaswa on hill van moon erne yada family chan or some pronounce it erne yada family kan. It depends on whether you're saying the C there is governed by the I that comes before or the A that comes after. Okay? So if you do this, if you pronounce it as ch or as k, either one's going to be fine with me. Ya dai huam li chan plaf si le us to dai. On, and again, here, same kind of thing. Is the pronunciation of the G governed by the R that comes before, in which case it would be hard G, or is it by the Y that comes afterwards, in which case it's the Y. On, I usually do the Y. On, for you, us, ur, you, tas, swa, swa, we, for you, va, urum, yilten, du. On, ne, yalad, hu, us, on, Kos nunge, eh, not a, ak tulus us o evele sodluche. Actually, that should be elus, smooth ending. What is this literally? Over here, it's translated deliver. Modern English, a loose. A loose us from evil. Think of what that metaphorically implies. All bound and tied up. Untie us. So, do it all together. Fader ure, thuthi ert on hyalvanu, si thin nama ye halvo, tobe kome thin riche, ye worthe thin wila on ervan, swa swa on hyalvanu. Ure ye dai hwamli chin hwaf, silu us to dai. And for you, us ure yiltas, swa swa we for yiva urum yiltendu. And then you lad to us on costume, at lus us o evene, so luce. Okay, we'll stop there since it's 925. You can read that to me, but it has to memorize it.